Coming up today, caber tossing and dancing in the Highlands of Scotland. Surf's up, we get on board with America's Courtney Conlogue. We journey to an MMA mecca, the world-renowned Tiger Muay Thai training camp. And flippers at the ready, it's the Bug Snorkeling World Championships. Located in Brooklyn's Dumbo neighborhood is America's oldest active boxing gym, Gleason's. A fixture in New York since 1937, the gym has been home to some of the biggest names in the fight game. Bruce Silverglade has been the owner here for almost 40 years. Okay, welcome to uh, Gleason's Gym and welcome to my office. Uh, one of my favorite spots in, in the gym. Uh, it's my museum, we have a lot of nice uh, things in here. Uh, I'm gonna point some of them out to you. Uh, we're gonna start over here with my first world champion, Jake Lamont, it's a signed autographed uh, uh, poster by him. And when we progress over here, uh, you have Muhammad Ali, you have Mike Tyson over here. That's a picture of Mike Tyson at 16 years of age. Uh, Floyd Mayweather, Mark Breland. And as we go around, uh, you can see there are many more pictures, all champions that trained out of Gleason's gym. We have championship belts, we have uh, quite a few signatures. This belt over here is the oldest one that I have. This is from 1982. Uh, this was uh, Juan Laporte when he won the, uh, the featherweight title for the WBC. In its 82 years, Gleason's has produced more than its fair share of world champions, with Muhammad Ali and Mike Tyson among the fighters who've honed their skills at the world's most famous boxing gym. From our beginning, from 1937 until today, we've had the 136 world champions, uh, the first being Jake LaMotta. Uh, right after Jake LaMotta, we had a fellow named Phil Terranova. Then the gym became uh, uh, quite hot, uh, so a lot of people would come into, into the gym and train. Uh, we currently have seven world champions training here, and for the first time in our history, all seven are female. So the females are really coming on strong, doing very, very well. Gleason's isn't just for potential world champions, though, with an eclectic mix of New Yorkers and visitors coming here to learn more about the noble art. I have about 1,200, actually, just a little over 1,200 members, 400 of which are, are female. So one third of my uh, boxers today are, are female. Uh, we have programs here for charitable purposes. We have uh, one group of people that have Parkinson's disease, they train here. Uh, we have wounded uh, uh, veterans that train here. Uh, we have children that are in a um, uh, bad place. Uh, and uh, we have them train here for free. Their, their, their organization is called Give a Kid a Dream. Um, we're starting a program right now for children with autism. So there are, there are many people that, uh, that train here and work here, and it's a huge mix. It's probably one of the last melting pots uh, anywhere in the United States. It's certainly not unusual for those training at Gleason's gym to find themselves rubbing shoulders with boxing royalty. Boxers are, uh, are very friendly people. They're people that uh, come from, the, uh, from your lowest socioeconomic areas. Uh, they appreciate people coming into the gym and doing what they like to do. Mike Tyson was always that way. Mike Tyson would go up to somebody uh, and assist them with a heavy bag, uh, answer their questions, sign their autographs, talk to them. Uh, but my favorite story uh, is about Muhammad Ali. So he was um, not able to, uh, to walk up our stairs as well back then. He was starting to get uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease and um, uh, uh, Parkinson's disease, and it was, it was affecting his mobility. So <clears throat> as his uh, driver was approaching, I said, listen, come around to the side of my building. I have a, a, an elevator over there, and I'll meet you on the street. I'll bring him up the elevator, and I'll have no problem. So everybody agreed. I went down, I'm, I'm waiting for uh, his limo to pull up. It arrives and he's getting out of the car. And uh, as, uh, as he's approaching me, a young lady is walking down the street and she's talking on her cell phone. And Muhammad Ali walks over to the young woman, takes the cell phone from her hand, starts talking to the person on the other end, puts his arm around the lady. That's Muhammad Ali, the most famous person in the world, but it's a typical boxer. Someone that relates to people, likes people, 
and um, uh, I just find that to be a, a typical boxing person. As well as a mecca for aspiring world champions, Gleason's is also a popular attraction for film fans, having featured in a number of classic boxing movies, including Raging Bull and Million Dollar Baby. The gym has five rings. We have 14,000 square feet and five rings. Uh, you can see on the walls, there are more uh, good pictures here on the outside. There are banners out for a number of our champions. There's a montage of pictures that uh, rings the entire gym. So it's very interesting for people when they come in. In our far corner over here, we have our ski bag area. Uh, on this corner, uh, we have some free weights. Uh, so it's a large gym and it's one that uh, many people from around the world come to uh, on a daily basis. Uh, we have tourists here, tour buses that stop here. As I said earlier, we've done movies in here, commercials in here. So it's a very active place and uh, it's very interesting and a place I like to be. Boxing gives us the subject for this week's sporting question. Last weekend, the super welterweight title bout between America's Claressa Shields and Croatia's Ivana Habazin had to be postponed after the Croatian's coach was attacked during the weigh-in, leaving the status of their long-awaited fight up in the air. Shields, already regarded as one of the greatest female boxers of all time, was hoping to become the quickest fighter, male or female, to win world titles at three different weight divisions, surpassing the record of Vasyl Lomachenko, arguably the world's best pound-for-pound -pound fighter who achieved the feat in 12 fights. The 24-year-old has already claimed two super middleweight titles and unified the middleweight division during her career and boasts an unbeaten 9-0 professional record. She also has two Olympic gold medals to her name. This latest incident means Shields will have to wait for her chance to make boxing history. But for this week's question, we'd like you to name the first ever women's boxing world champion. We'll bring you the answer later in the show. The World Rallycross Championship is fast reaching its climax, with Riga in Latvia hosting the penultimate race of the 2019 series. Sweden's Hansen brothers, Timmy and Kevin, have been battling it out at the top of the standings all year. But strong showings from Norway's Andreas Bakkerud at the last two events had seen him move into top spot. These three were the ones to watch in Riga, although a number of local drivers, including Janis Baumanis, had their eyes on home glory. One thing was for sure, victory would go to the man who left everything out on the track. A regular fixture on the World Rallycross calendar since 2016, the Latvian capital is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, as well as a rallycross hotspot. This year's World Championship has been the closest to date and the race in Riga was pivotal. Just two points separated the top three drivers in the standings with only two rounds remaining. Timmy Hansen won the previous meet in France whilst Andreas Bakkerud held the lead in the overall standings. Both men were eager to impress in Riga. France was a great race for me. Uh, obviously racing there we have so much support and to win there is so special. Dad has also won in Loyac um, and back then it was also the biggest race so we've got a lot of history there. I think with the championship being this close and that we are three drivers it's all about now and it's all about making all the smart choices and that's not only between the three of us. We've got a lot of wildcard entries um, and they're gonna be fast, they can be up there, they can make some good launches and and they don't have anything to lose, but they have everything to win. Uh, it's a championship on the line. Green light, great start by Timmy Hansen. Kevin Hansen to Andreas Backer moves across. Liam Dora goes inside to try and protect. Tim Azjanov's alongside Timmy Hansen. Tim Azjanov drops, he's in the wall almost. Flex the car back round, Andreas Backer avoids him. So Kevin Hansen drops down to P5, backwards down in P4. Going to try and come through. Liam Dora opens the door to him. Uh, 
Hanson. And Doyle's going to try and close it on Kevin, but he can't. Kevin Hanson sneaks through. And it's Timmy Hanson who leads from Niklas Kronholm and Timmy Timmersjano. Backer drops to fourth. Oh, my goodness. What a dream start for Timmy Hanson there. Just got the lodge. We were saying we didn't know if that grid slot was going to be any good, but he just proved us completely wrong. Yeah, it's settings. It's settings. They've all got it wrong. Oh, mistake from Backer. Backer drops back. Kronholm goes straight to the joke lap. So Kronholm's gone immediately to the joker. He thinks he's got the pace. to try and get out in front of Kevin Hanson. If he doesn't, that's not going to be ideal. So Niklas needs to beat Kevin to the merge here. Andreas Backer had made a mistake, and Niklas does get Kevin. So Niklas is in front of Kevin. Andreas can't really joke now, can he? Because he'll end up in trouble with Kevin. No, Andreas just has to lay down the laps now. He doesn't want to drop, drop back behind uh, Kevin, at least. And he wants to try and gap Niklas at this point. They've just got to keep it sensible, bring the cars home, and they know they go to South Africa. Oh, well, it could be, they could be equal. Backer goes Joker, he has to if he wants to split the strategy from Timmy, he might as well. Yeah, he may as well, I mean, he's not going to get Gronholm, well and it also covers him off from Kevin Hansen. It's closer than I thought, has he got a chance of getting Niklas here? Niklas coming around the outside, no, he's going to be in front. So Niklas is going to be in front. It's going to require a mistake now from the Finn for Backer to take P2 and to keep the lead in the championship here. In towards the wall, he's onto the last lap, as is Timmy Hansen. So Timmy Hansen, I'm sure he's going to be nervous. Timmy Hansen fought back from Abu Dhabi. He fought back from the disaster in Canada. He's going to take his fourth win of the year here in Latvia. And if Bakkerud finishes third, Hansen will be equal on points, but at the top of the standings, and that's how it ends. Timmy Hansen takes his fourth win, Kronholm. In between him and Bakkerud, Timmy knows. He knows. It was a disaster yesterday, and he leaves here at the top of the World Championship standings, equal with Andreas Bakkerud. What a recovery weekend we've done, all of us. So yesterday was so tough, uh, and the whole team came together. Now there was such good spirit, and we never gave up hope. This came, this came from the heart. Like I gave it everything. Congrats. And uh, I'm so proud. I'm so proud of of the boys who put this together. I, I won't say everybody's name, but you know, wow. So it's a showdown in South Africa as the championship will be decided at the season finale next month. When I put that jersey on, that other realm gets unlocked and it's that competitive realm and that competitive heart and that fire that really is deep, deep down in the core. Courtney Conlog is one of the world's leading surfers. Her power, athleticism and competitive zeal have added a new dimension to surfing's championship tour. A two-time runner-up in the women's tour standings, she's become renowned for her gritty determination, incredible work ethic and her arduous pursuit of perfection. Courtney hails from Santa Ana in Southern California. Situated some 30 miles southeast of Los Angeles and 30 minutes from the nearest beach, it should be more of a breeding ground for skateboarders than surfers. Courtney was introduced to surfing at the age of four by her father, Richard. At weekends, the Conlog family would flee the suburbs and head for the coast, where Courtney would spend hours developing her board riding skills. Conlog made rapid progress and hit the headlines age 12 after taking some significant scalps at the prestigious US Open of surfing. It all came as something of a surprise to her friends at school. No one knew I surfed before then. They knew I had funny tan lines and stuff. They just knew I played basketball a lot and I never told them that I did surfing. Just because back in the day, there's this image of what a surfer was and I didn't want people to judge me by my cover. Courtney grew up surfing alongside her brother. Three years her junior, Ryan Conlog is also an accomplished board rider. 
Their competitive instincts were honed by their father, who would encourage them to surf against one another in mock heats. When conditions are good, the sibling rivalry resurfaces, but when it's flat, having fun is the order of the day. She's very lighthearted and has this very um, bubbly attitude about her. It's kind of a hard thing to do, have that very serious competitive side and the side that just wants to have fun. And I think that's what allows her to be so fierce. This is not in her, she delegates it towards certain areas. And um, that allows her to really focus her energy to be light and ser um, serious at, at other points when she needs to. In 2009, Courtney established herself as a future force on the championship tour when she won the US Open at Huntington Beach, aged just 16, displaying the powerful surfing style that has become her trademark. Conlog's athletic prowess can be traced back to her childhood. She took up Taekwondo, aged four, learning the value of hard work and discipline. At school, Courtney was an outstanding track and field athlete. Her ability to excel in everything from the 400 meters to the pole vault earned her the nickname Superwoman. These days, the 27-year-old is regarded as one of the fittest women on tour, and her strength and conditioning program is overseen by a man whose other clients include a team of Navy SEALs. Through the years, my training regime has really evolved. Uh, before, it was probably more intense weight, um, doing squats with heavy weight and resistance. And now it's more body weight, body movement, and uh, functionality to surf. Uh, maybe not the movement that we do exactly with surf, because it's not really functionally right for the body. But to get your body strong in those particular ways are we need to be strong in this area. So this, so you'll have an enormous amount of explosion going back this way. Air trying to escape. That's dead. It's fluffy, it's like a cloud. Conlog's gritty, hyper-competitive image hasn't always worked in her favor. Early on in her career, she was dropped by a couple of sponsors, despite having recorded a string of competition wins. The surfing industry appeared to have overlooked some of the other aspects of Courtney's character. I have always loved art. To me, it's my way of writing things down and showing things that I love and enjoy on a piece of canvas, whether it's painting a lion or drawing something that makes me laugh or painting waves. Um, it's just my way to switch off my mind from s surfing. Courtney has been developing her skills with the help of local artist Phil Roberts. He's so positive and uh, when you're an artist, having the confidence of stroke and just backing yourself when you put a line somewhere and knowing why you put it there and um, yeah, he really inspires me to just see where I could go with my art. Water motion going in this direction with the surface water. Roberts has previously curated a Women of Surfing exhibition which featured a number of Courtney's works. <laughs> her power uh, that you see that she has in her surfing is also carried across in her paintings as well. She paints very strong, powerful waves and uh, her, her drawings and paintings come off with a, a ton of energy. So I'm just guiding her as far as materials, tools and uh, techniques in painting just to hone her skills. I'm excited that She's going to have a, a, if she would like, a really strong artistic career after her surfing, after her professional surfing career. And it'll be able to carry over and transfer. She's, she's got that much ability. Next year, surfing will make its Olympic debut in Japan, and Conlog recognizes that it's a huge opportunity for her sport and is intent on representing Team USA at the Games. Before that, there's the small matter of trying to secure that first world title. But win or lose, Courtney will continue to inspire both within and outside of the surfing world. Try and make what I do influence people to be better and be more positive and pursue their dreams and um, believe that things are possible. Um, 
So wherever that takes me, um, I've always been someone who wants to influence people to have a positive heart and dream and believe that they can change people in a good way. What do you get if you mix badminton, tennis, and table tennis? Pickleball, one of the fastest growing sports in the world. The game was created in America in the 1960s by a few senators who wanted to make a game for all ages. Pickleball features special paddles, a slightly modified tennis net, a badminton court, and a plastic wiffle ball. We travel to a pickleball tournament in England to find out more. Now, the name Pickleball, there are two um, uh, histories on that. Some people say it's because their dog was named Pickles and he used to retrieve um, the ball. Others um, say, and I believe this is the true one, um, that uh, it was named after um, a boat, a pickle boat. I, I don't know what a pickle boat is, but I think it might be like a rowing boat, something like that. Um, either way, it's a strange name. The inaugural English Open Pickleball Tournament took place in Nottingham, attracting plucky amateurs as well as top international players from 17 countries. Former footballers, tennis and squash players all entered the mix at the event, each hoping for a shot at pickleball glory. Karen Mitchell is the co-tournament director and has spent the last few years trying to raise awareness of the sport. For me, the reason I wanted to do this is I wanted to see the Bainbridge Cup, which is the International Federation of Pickleballs, um, the equivalent of like the Ryder Cup. I wanted to see that taking place in the UK. And so I put in a bid to host it. And this is my dry run um, before we host that next year. We've actually won that um, and uh, we'll be hosting it here next year. Pickleball is almost exclusively played in doubles, with players paired together according to their skill level. Former WTA tennis player Thaddea Locke is a recent convert to the sport. So I actually went on holiday last year, in September last year, to, the, to America and stayed with some friends. And they had been talking to me about pickleball and they said, oh, you should come and try pickleball. So I was like, OK, so I went and played. And I found it really fun. And then they said to me, oh, you have to play when you go home. And I said, we don't play this sport in England. And they're like, no, no, you do. So then when I came home, I kind of Googled some clubs and I found somewhere to play. And I just, I loved it. I played tennis professionally, so, but I'm kind of done with playing competitively now. So this is kind of like a new thing that I can transfer my skills to and play competitively. And it's really fun. A lot of the movements are similar to tennis, like the stop start, the moving direction. And again, the hand skills, it's, it's kind of a quicker, a quicker sport, but it's still a lot of my tennis swings and shots I can use in pickleball. The rules are relatively simple and the game is easy for beginners to learn, but it can develop into a quick, fast-paced, competitive game for the more experienced players. Once people have tried it, they're kind of hooked, but in this country I think not many people know about it. People will say to me kind of, where, what have you been playing this weekend? What is that sport that I've been seeing you doing? So it's just, I think, increasing the awareness, you know, getting it on TV, getting as much media coverage of it as we can, and then kind of increasing the amount of places that you can play. And I guess players like us who play kind of maybe using it to run coaching sessions and just attract new people to the sport. Most people are eventually forced to give up playing competitive sport as they get older. But pickleball is well suited for players of all ages. The thing is, I played football, and now when you get to a 60 and you're chasing 20-year-olds around the football, it's impossible. But uh, this game is the one game you can take on 20-year-olds and beat them because it's the, the courts, are, you know, it's a badminton sort of size court. Um, and an old, it really attracts older players because a lot of tennis players that can't cover a tennis court are now playing pickleball. We, we get a lot of over 60s in that, but you know, it's for everybody. Uh, but, but you know. Especially, well, retired people, for instance, a lot of them just sit, they're, they're, they're bored, they haven't got friends, they, they, they sit at home, they don't know what to do. You, the good thing about Pickleball is it's so social, you know, we get meet so many people. I mean, here we just know everybody, we, we all get on, we have a part, big party afterwards. It's a fantastic, like, sporting holiday, really, you know, so get out there, find a club, 
you go into the Pickle England website and you, you can find your nearest club and come along, you know. Most people are competitive, they, you know, and it, it allows you to be competitive. It's exciting, you want to be competitive uh, yeah, when you get into your 60s. So, you know, it gives you that chance. That's great. England's Jamie Basford is only 14 and is already making a name for himself in pickleball circles. I just looked at it and went, wow, it's like, because I've picked it up like really quickly, which is quite uh, strange because it's quite a weird game. So I just thought, well, I'm never, not going to start playing this for a while. I think you, once you start, you just get lured in by all different rules because once you start, you're like trying to get the third shots and stuff like that. And you just want to keep on improving because you see like the pros on Facebook or YouTube play and you're just like, wow, it's like, I want to be like that. Jamie's tennis background has allowed him to excel in the pickleball arena, and because of the nature of the sport, he's found himself competing against players of all ages. It's quite strange, but after a while I got used to it because there's no one really my age that plays really, so I have to get used to playing older people. And I think within a year or two, you know, um, it's going to be everybody will know about pickleball. I mean, eventually it will be an Olympic sport. And there are more unusual court based sports in this week's top five. First up is Peteca. This Brazilian game is similar to badminton, only using hands instead of rackets. The sport was originally played by the indigenous Tupi tribesmen before Portuguese settlers arrived in Brazil in the 16th century. The Argentinian sport of pad bowl takes place on a purpose-built indoor court. As in soccer, the use of hands or arms is forbidden, but any other part of the body may be used. The ball can either be volleyed or it's allowed to bounce once. Sepak takwa or kick volleyball has been played in Southeast Asia in various forms for over 500 years. Players use their feet, head, knees and chest to get the rattan ball over the net, which they often do in fairly spectacular fashion. The sport of Dachau is similar to Sepak Takro, only it's played with a shuttlecock instead of a ball. Also known as foot badminton, it's considered to be the national sport of Vietnam where it enjoys huge popularity, particularly in the country's capital, Hanoi. And at number one, a sport that's rapidly growing in popularity across Germany, Hedis. The game combines the heading ability of soccer with the tactical skills of table tennis. And as you can see, it's something to behold. Every year, the peaceful town of Dunoon in Scotland hosts one of the country's biggest traditional events, the Cowell Highland Games. Over 23,000 visitors from across the globe come here to celebrate an event steeped in history and tradition. The games feature band piping competitions, heavy athletic sporting events, and also the World Highland Dancing Championships. Every year, the Scottish Fishing Board, we have a, a textbook with the, there's like 12, 15, 20 steps in some of the dances, and we pick the, the, the competitive dancers that are older dance a six step Highland Fling. And within that, every year we, we pick six steps that they have to perform. There's always the first step and the last step and anything else in between. But within the anything else in between, the differentiation most of the times in the fling comes down to back steps and rhythms of shakes and rocking, whether they're in the right rhythm, placings. It's, it's all very technical and timing oriented and the quality of the performance that they're dancing. Because you can have two dancers side by side that look to the, the non-dancing person that look really, really nice, but to our eye, a very technical person, 
can see the big, the, the big variance between the two. Every child gets a market of 100. Um, so every kid starts off at that level. That 100 is defined by 80% um, of that mark. So 80 is on the technique, 10% is on timing, like the time and the interpret the, the, the rhythms within each of the steps, and 10% um, on how they hold their body, deportment, and how they look. Um, it, it's all about the judge having the eye for the detail. Um, what is actually happening in front of them. And we try desperately to make, ensure that adjudicators are not looking to decide what happened with a dancer yesterday or last week or last month. It's what is actually happening in front of them at that time. As well as attracting Highland dancers from as far afield as South Africa and New Zealand, this year's World Championships also featured judges from all over the world, forming a truly international panel and showcasing the sport's wider global appeal. I live in Houston, Texas, and actually where um, I teach at, it's part of the curriculum for the children who attend that school. It's a private school, and every child has to take Highland dancing from kindergarten through fifth grade. Now, it's the only place in the world like it, so I've been there for 38 years. As I see it, to, to be a great Highland dancer, it takes the, the strength of a gymnast and the grace of a ballerina. And so when you put those together and you have those dancers who do those movements that we have in Highland, and they do it just so perfectly to the music, on the beat of the music, um, there's, uh, I mean, what you're gonna see today is some of the best dance in the whole world, and it gives me chills all the time. You know, for 33 years I've been coming here in a row, um, and I wouldn't miss it. It's one of my favorite days. You have to wear a tartan, obviously, for your kilt, and there's all kinds of beautiful tartans out now that they're used, you know, they used to be where it's darker colors, but now it's, you see the white background and the brighter colors, and there's always like, oh, that's a turquoise one or a red one or a purple, or, um, that's the kilt that they wear. Then there's a jacket or a waistcoat um, that they wear on the top half. Normally it's very fitted to them, and then kilt toes, dancing shoes, which are very soft leather shoes hair up in a bun always, and looking, looking neat and tidy. We all travel from all over the world to come here to see the greats of the great compete. And um, to, to all of those that, to the parents, to the teachers, to the adjudicators, and to especially Danoon, the, the the committee who puts on our world championships, um, thank you to all of them because we wouldn't be able to carry on this wonderful sport if we didn't have those, everybody doing their job. We are so proud in Scotland that our heritage and our Highland dancing is performed throughout the world. It, it's just, it blows me away. I'm very fortunate quite a lot of the times to go to different countries. And when you get there and you see the standard of the work, you know that what we're doing and what everybody has done in the past has done a real good job. And we, we now have to carry that mantle and keep it going. You know, they call it Tiger Muay Thai. A lot of people here have that kind of tiger mentality. The weather, the heat, it lives up to its expectations. This is Khalil Roundtree Jr. making the walk for his eighth UFC appearance. He spent the last six weeks of his camp at the famed Tiger Muay Thai. George Hickman is in his corner here tonight. There's something special about being able to train in Thailand. Woo! Woo! Oh my goodness! There are dudes right now booking their trip to Thailand. Phuket, Thailand is the home of Tiger Muay Thai, one of the world's leading MMA training centers. 
I think a lot of the guys see the tryout video, right? And they see all these guys like working hard. They see the trainers beating them to the dirt. That's one of the things that drew me here. I wanted to see if it's really hard training, and it is. The way that the ties train, these guys live it. They live fighting since they're five years old. The work ethic here is hard, it's hot. We're training outside. The focus here is really just like show up, train, hard work, train, hard work, train. There's not much else to do around this place but just eat, sleep, and train. And it's and then everybody comes down here for that reason and it and it shows. People come here all the time and they're like, oh, you know, I was just expecting, you know, an MMA program, but you know, really good Muay Thai. But the wrestling is very high level, the jiu-jitsu is very high level, and obviously the training partners I think is a big thing as well. There's just so many people from around the world in different countries. A lot of guys come to get ready for, you know, UFC fights. For instance, Khalil now or Alex Volkanovsky or Peter Jan. They all have their own gyms back in their countries as well. They're not here full time. <laughs> It was a dream of mine to come in Thailand and train. I'm a striker, so it's like the mecca of a, of a, of a striker here. So. All trainers here, they have an average 200 fights, average. So they have a lot of experience. You just have to be careful to don't be tricked on the vacation mode, because it's easy to be tricked, like, oh, the beach is just right there. You can be in a vacation place, like paradise, and as well have a, a proper training. A lot of UFC fighters come to Tiger Muay Thai. Probably between 20 and 30 different UFC fighters is the house of champion. In Thailand, Tiger Muay Thai taking care uh, about everything about us. What I have to do, just show up. Valentina, she had been here since 2010. At that time, she just fight Muay Thai, no BJJ, no grappling. She told me I'll be UFC champion. Now she's the champion. UFC Performance Institute number one for me in Las Vegas. In Thailand, it's Tiger Muay Thai. <laughs> you can see a lot of international fighters because everyone wants to come and to train and have uh, this good experience. So Valentina and Antonina, they've been at Tiger almost as long as I've been here, coming back and forth. They love to travel, so they're not always here, but it's great to have them around. It's great for our girls that are still on lower level circuit fighting in different promotions to be able to train with them. It's pretty cool to see how Tigers, just in the five years that I've been here, how it's grown and how it continues to grow. And I think the future is very bright. We're getting a lot of fighters that have been with us before they made it to the UFC that are now in the UFC. It's not only a tropical paradise to come and visit, but it's also a place that you can improve as a fighter and really get to that next level. Murky, boggy, you bump into stuff as you go. You're not entirely sure what it is you're bumping into. Um, uh, apparently things live in there, apparently there are eels. Um, so I'm told. I don't like water and I've never worn a snorkel before. <laughs> I can't breathe in the snorkel, so I just took it off. To beat the bog, you've got to be the bog. The Welsh countryside near the town of Clamwerted, Wales is the location for one of the more unusual events on the British sporting calendar, the Bog Snorkeling World Championships. Bernice Benton is the event's compare. 
they're all having a wonderful time. You know, Clenuted is the, the place people come if they're a little bit eccentric or they, they just want to do something different, not be judged by anything. They can be as crazy as they like here. 176 competitors from all over the world signed up to swim two lengths of a 55-metre bog, wearing flippers, snorkels and any costume of their choice. Three, two, one, go. I did my PhD in tropical peat swamp forests in Malaysian Borneo, um, and since then I've been a bit in love with peat of all kinds. Weather conditions were glorious for this, the 34th edition of the event. Traditional swimming strokes are forbidden at the championships and competitors are only allowed to raise their heads to make sure they're going in the right direction. The reigning world champion is Britain's Neil Rutter, who was certainly feeling the pressure ahead of his swim Nervous, to be honest. <laughs> the last few times was good fun. Uh, this time, I admit to having some butterflies. Uh, ask me again in a minute and a, in a, minute and a bit. <laughs> well, it was a quick minute and a bit from Neil, but still not as fast as the world record of 1 minute 18 seconds he set in 2018. If you're a 400 metre runner, that burn that you get in that last bit when you're just desperately trying to make it to the line, it's very, very similar, except on this you're breathing through a snorkel. And uh, So imagine uh, that sort of burn, but without being able to breathe properly. Um, it's that sort of challenge, it's really quite tough. Despite the challenges, Neil Rutter took top honours once again to retain the world title. No doubt he'll be donning his flippers and challenging for the crown again at next year's Bog Snorkeling World Championships. And now the answer to this week's sporting question. Earlier in the show, we asked you to name the first ever women's boxing world champion. The answer is battling Barbara Buttrick. In October 1957, the four foot 11 English woman outclassed Phyllis Kugler over six rounds to win the first ever licensed women's world championship bout. Due to her short stature and slight frame, Buttrick was nicknamed the Mighty Atom of the Ring and was often paired against women in heavier weight categories than her natural flyweight. Over the course of her 12-year career, she achieved a 30-1 win-loss record, as well as a legacy of over 1,000 exhibition bouts, mostly against men. In 1993, Barbara set up the Women's International Boxing Federation and she's still the president of the organisation. Now 88 years old, it's thanks to the pioneering work and dedication of Barbara Buttrick that female boxers such as Clarissa Shields have the opportunities they have today. Let's return to Dunoon in Scotland now for another visit to the Cowell Highland Games. The event's most iconic competition is collectively known as the Heavy Events. The gathering attracts the world's top heavy athletes to compete in a range of traditional Scottish strong sports, from tossing the caber to shot-putting the historic Cowell Stone. I used to compete myself here. I'm three times heaviest champion here. And now I'm convener and head official to make sure all the events go proper on the day. The events we had today was the standing putt, a stone only. Then we had the shot putt, the weight for distance, the hammer, the weight over the bar, and then last but not least, the caber. The rules have changed a wee touch over the years, just wee tweaks here and there, but it's the same. You must wear your kilt, you must have hose on, which is your socks. The way it was hundreds of years ago, and it's the same event. Uh, 
I used to do strongman and powerlifting, and then I used to do a little bit of shot put. That combined makes, makes for a good Highland Games training. One day I got a phone call from Scotland, and they said, you want to try Highland Games? Never tried it before. They flew me over and uh, I fell in love with it. I mean, I love games like this. Uh, you know the guys, you get to meet your old friends again, and uh, you know, you get to travel the world and throw stuff in a kilt, and you know, it's pretty good. I'm from Barhead, near Glasgow, uh, and I got into the Highland Games through track and field athletics. I was uh, competing as a shot putter for Scotland, and one of the guys I trained with was competing in this, and he persuaded me to come along. This is um, one of my favourite games. It's in such a nice place. Um, they look after us very well here. We always have a, a kind of a bit of a night out on the Friday. We, we normally compete Friday, Saturday, and we have a, a wee drink on the Friday, so that's always quite good. Because normally when we go to our games, you'll all go to our games, then you will go home. You don't really get to socialise with the competitors that much. Well, this is this is a good one to, for that. I'm from a little town called Crick in England. Um, I first got into the games about seven, eight years ago through Alan Pettigrew. Um, I'm a wire hammer thrower, so that's that's my sport. And I turned up. I was on holiday, just had a go, and then got invited back from then, and just keep coming back and back. I got into the games because I fell out of love with football. Uh, I played it kind of semi-professionally until I was 23. I wanted a different sport to try, and I wanted an individual sport because I was kind of sick of relying on like team aspect of things, and I wanted to see how I would go in an individual sport. So there was a guy in the gym who kept on pestering me when I played football because I was athletic to try the games. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to be in the in the gym, so I would go outside and throw because I got to enjoy the sun and I got in it and I enjoyed it from there. When I lifted at the same gym, gym as Neil, he used to keep all his equipment in the gym. So I would just take his equipment out and throw in the track that was beside it. But then I moved up to Glasgow and I had to get my own equipment made. But I just went to a steel fabricator and said, this is what I want, want it to look like. Uh, the shot putts are obviously easy to get your hands on because of athletics. But at the other events, a wee bit more niche, I just went to a steel fabricator and I was like, oh, can you do me something that looks like this, that weighs around this? And they, they knocked it up for me. I'm from Austria and uh, actually it's uh, only my second Highland Games. Uh, last year I was also here um, and usually I'm doing track and field athletics and a guy from Austria, he uh, just said, oh, um, they invited us to come to the Cowell Highland Games, would you like to try it? And then I said, well, yeah, I could. <laughs> and I was very glad that I said yes, because last year and this year is really, really great. The people are great and yeah, everything's perfect. The heritage, the history, the fun behind it all, and we attract international athletes from the amateur side as well as strongman and people just loving this event in general.